Hey, aloha, good Monday morning to everyone. I'm Yanji Denise. Thank you so much for joining us here on the COVID Care Conversation sponsored by the Hawaii Executive Collaborative and right here on the Honolulu Star Advertiser Facebook page. Ryan, how are you on this Monday morning? Hey, a lot going on here on Monday. Uh, of course, we took a few days off. We are now here at our new time at 1030, where we will continue to be uh, every day during the week. We want to encourage those of you who are tuning in to like us, to share this page, and to ask your questions today. We have back with us Dr. Rupi, who are going to be answering some of your questions. And we want to get to her right away. Uh, we know that there are a lot of questions out there. A lot of people maybe uh, have some questions directly for Dr. Rupi. So we're going to bring her into the broadcast. Uh, good morning, Dr. Rupi. Good to see you again. Good morning. Uh, let's start off talking about masks. We're seeing uh, this effort now from the mayor, Honolulu Mayor Kirk Caldwell, saying and encouraging people to wear masks. We're even seeing the CDC, uh, not necessarily saying it's mandatory, but also recommending that. What are your thoughts on the masks? And is that something that is something that will help people fight this pandemic? Yes. So the reason why they're now recommending masks is because we are seeing more and more communities spread. Uh, COVID-19 is in our community. It's obvious that it's being spread from one person to the next. And we're also learning a lot more about the virus. As things evolve, things are going to constantly change. Recommendations are constantly going to change. And so what we're seeing now with the community spread is that folks who are asymptomatic, who have zero symptoms, are starting to spread the virus more and more without realizing it. What that means is basically when somebody is coughing, sneezing, we know that those droplets are being spread into the environment, right? But what's happening is folks that don't even have symptoms are also spreading those droplets into the environment. So somebody who has no symptoms when they're coughing, when, or not when they're coughing, sorry, when they're talking, when they're laughing, there's a chance that those droplets are also being spread as far as three to six feet. So for example, let's say I have no symptoms whatsoever and I'm talking to you and my surrounding areas are getting sprayed with microscopic droplets. And what happens is if somebody's sitting standing or sitting close to me, that's gonna spread to them directly because they could inhale it or it's spread onto the surfaces around me and then somebody goes and touches that, touches their face and now there's been transmission. So this is the reason they're now recommending for everybody to wear masks, not only to protect yourself, but also to protect others, because that mask is going to help prevent those droplets from spreading into the environment and spreading to somebody else to breathe it in. It also helps to prevent you from touching your face. So in general, masks, especially cloth masks, we know that they're not 100 percent effective. But if it prevents you from touching your face when you're in public, that's going to help. So it's really key to use mask hygiene. So you're washing your hands before you're putting the mask on, washing your hands before you take the mask off. But also, when you have the mask on, don't fidget with it. I, I do see a lot of folks in the community wearing masks and, you know, kind of scratching their nose or, you know, fidgeting with the bottom of it. It can be uncomfortable. So the key is don't touch your face. When it's on, that means don't touch your face but also using the hand hygiene when you're using masks. Um, Shar has a question this morning asking, do we need to wear masks at home? Um, so if somebody is sick in the home, somebody's coughing, sneezing, then yes, that person should definitely be wearing masks in the home because otherwise they're gonna spread it to the others in the house. Okay, now uh, also Brandon is wondering, because we see so many people now making their own masks, there's been bandana tutorials. What fabric do you recommend when making a mask? Obviously, we wanna save the actual medical grade, the N95s, those are for our frontline healthcare workers, but if I'm someone at home and I've decided to make my own mask, is there a particular fabric you recommend over another? Uh, that's a great question. Um, mm -hmm. At this point, as far as fabrics, uh, <laughs> The, the tighter the fabric is, probably the better. However, that can potentially give a false sense of security. Cloth face masks aren't going to necessarily prevent the virus from getting through. The only masks that are preventing the, the, the virus from getting through entirely is going to be the medical grade masks. So as far as what cloth you're using, the main reason you're using this is to prevent really touching your face. It's not really to prevent the virus from getting through the mask. Okay, you mentioned gloves, uh, and we'd love to talk to you a little bit about that because when I've gone to the grocery store, the few times that I have gone, I see people wearing masks, and I also see a lot of folks wearing rubber gloves. So gloves 
can give a false sense of security. And my worry is that when you're wearing gloves, you're more likely to touch a bunch of different surfaces and not really think about it. Because the main thing that you're thinking about when you're touching surfaces are, is the surface contaminated? And the assumption at this point should kind of be yes, that most surfaces that you're touching assume that if somebody else has touched it, that that surface has been contaminated with virus, right? So if you're using gloves, that still doesn't change that. If you're touching one surface and then another, you might be moving those viruses around too, especially if you're touching things and then touching your face. So I have seen that. And that would be my worry is that folks might be um, doing kind of riskier things because they think they have gloves on so they're protected. The other thing is when you're putting gloves on and taking them off, again, you want to make sure that you're using appropriate hygiene. So oftentimes, and I'll show you, folks that are that are wearing gloves, uh, when they're wearing them, you need to be able to make sure that you're taking them off properly. You don't want to touch any of the actual surfaces. So I'm going to show you by putting on a pair of gloves. So when you're taking them off, you want to make sure that you're not touching any, any surface that's going to potentially contaminate. So this hand, let's say you're about to take them off, you can use this hand to grab the bottom of it. You wanna take it inside out of your hand so that you're not actually touching. And then use your other opposite clean hand. You wanna go inside the glove and do the same thing. So, and then you're gonna wrap it around the other glove so that you're not touching any actual surfaces that touched anything and throw that into the garbage. So that you haven't touched any surface from the outside of the glove and then throw that away. That is uh, pretty complicated. And then, because the thing I worry about is just what you said that you put gloves on and then you touch your steering wheel and you touch your phone and you touch everything. And somehow you think that gloves have inoculated you against everything. They really haven't. The hand washing is still so important. So, and, and we've been stressing this from the beginning, even before COVID-19 entered into the United States, We've been stressing the importance of hand hygiene and respiratory hygiene. Those are your two mainstays in fighting this. I know it sounds really simple. It sounds basic. People are sick of hearing us talking about hand washing and the 20 seconds and how important it is. But I can't stress that enough because that's really what's going to be getting that off of your, you know, preventing you from contaminating yourself. Um, jo Joan has a great question here, which is what is the best protocol for shopping at Safeway type of stores? If you are going to the grocery store, you're interacting with a shopping cart, you're pulling things off the shelves. What's sort of the best way to do that? I know in and out is, is really important. So essentials quick as possible. Um, something I'm seeing that needs to be addressed is just the mass number of people that are showing up for shopping at the same time. Um, because that's a crowd. And again, we're trying to work on the social distancing, trying to keep people at home. Um, the crowds are not conducive to that. And we know that six feet of distance is good when people don't have symptoms. But if somebody's coughing or sneezing around you, that six feet doesn't make as much uh, difference. We need even even longer distances um, of distance because some of those really forceful coughs and sneezes, if somebody's not wearing a mask, that can travel up to 20 to 30 feet. So that six feet of social distancing is really for the people that don't have any symptoms that might be spreading it without, without having symptoms. But recent studies and recent things that are, that are being shown show those droplets can spray even further. So it's really important that you're avoiding anybody who's sick. Anybody who's sick in general should not be out and about to begin with. Um, they should be wearing masks if there is an absolute emergency. But if somebody's out doing life essential shopping or you know they're at Safeway and they need to pick up uh, milk or whatever it might be, making sure that you're cognizant of whatever you're touching and not touching your face. Like, that should be the general rule when you are outside of your home. Be very cognizant that you're not touching your face, that you have hand sanitizer on you because you probably can't wash your hands directly immediately in, in the grocery store using hand sanitizer. And then as soon as you get home, also you, making sure to wash your hands properly. Uh, we talked a little bit last time about wiping down surfaces. Uh, we know that the virus can survive on different surfaces for different periods of time. So if you do have the disinfectants we've talked about that are available on the CDC and the EPA.gov websites, um, those are disinfectants that you can use to help to wipe things, wipe surfaces down. If they're non-perishable, just leaving them in the garage for up to three days. You know, we're getting a lot of comments, so we want to thank people for uh, sending them in. One of the comments that we actually though got through our uh, coronavirushawaii.com website was, we're hearing talks uh, that this could potentially, 
the number of cases could go down in the summer months. Uh, is that something that we can expect to see? And would that make a difference here in Hawaii where the temperature is already like summer? Um, so I've, I've heard the same thing and it's still too early to say when we look at other viruses and, and really we have to rely on our knowledge of other viruses and what other viruses have done. Um, we've done that in the past because we just don't know enough about this virus and viruses like the flu tend to slow down in summer months. You know, obviously there's flu season. There's a reason for flu season in colder months. Folks tend to congregate in smaller spaces. There's usually less ventilation. It's cold outside. Everybody's inside. Um, and so that actually promotes passing of the virus. We're lucky here in Hawaii that we have uh, such beautiful weather and folks tend to be outdoors more. We can open our windows, we can open our doors and get good ventilation. Um, and so in general, those are good things because they help prevent folks from really congregating closely together. Um, but we just, we don't know how COVID-19 is going to act. We, at this point, we only have three months of data and that is it. If you think about it, all these other viruses, all these other infections, We've got decades, if not centuries, of knowledge about how they behave and what they do and how we can manage them. COVID-19 has only been around since December, and that is all we know about it. So when we're wondering, what, why are things changing and why don't we know this or why were we told you know, one thing and now we're being told something else, it's because we're learning as we go. We just don't know enough about it. But we are learning a lot, obviously, as it's spreading and finding out just how contagious it is. And that comparison to the flu early on, we realized was very wrong because this is not the flu. This is much more dangerous than the flu. And we're learning that as people are getting infected and as we're learning about the disease process. I want to go back to something you said about seeing too many people out and about, especially in stores. Can you clarify, because I think people need a reminder as to what is actually essential. So when we think about what is essential, it should be life sustaining. At this point, the concern is that this infection is not just affecting our elderly. It's not just affecting our immunocompromised like we were previously seeing. We're now seeing young, healthy people going from having you know, very little symptoms to suddenly ending up on life support, which is very, very scary. For us in the healthcare community, we're seeing it firsthand. So obviously we're, we're being on the front lines um, we're, we're seeing it more than, than the public is seeing it. So it's really scaring us because we're seeing folks not taking this seriously and still congregating, still going about daily activities, not knowing that this, especially on the mainland, I mean, I'm talking to folks first, you know, that are front lines in New York and places that are really heavily affected. And it's, it's scary to see what's happening. Um, you're risking your life. Think of it that way every time that you're going out. And so as far as essential things that you're doing, they should be life sustaining, meaning you can't survive without doing them. Grocery shopping is a great example. Can't survive without food, so obviously need to be going out to get food. But if you think about the other things, am I gonna risk my life to go to Home Depot? Am I gonna risk my life to go to the pet store? Probably not. If you can have something shipped, have it shipped. If you absolutely need to go out, that would be the only reason for something that is life-sustaining or essential. A great question here from Sam Julian. Is it advisable when you get home from shopping to take your clothes off as soon as possible before entering your home? So this question, I think we, we kind of talked about it last week as well. Um, for the general community at this point, we know there's community spread, um, but it's, it, <laughs> It's not as important as somebody who's working in healthcare. Let's put it that way. If somebody's working in healthcare and they're surrounded by COVID patients, um, then obviously that person should be making sure to take those clothes off, wash them. And by washing them, they have to be washed uh, with heat. So you want hot water and you also want to use the dryer because that's going to be what kills the virus. If you don't have a dryer sticking it out in the sun, um, the UV should help. But at this point, there hasn't been a recommendation for the general community because it's less likely that you're going to be coming across um, COVID-19 that's going to attach to your clothes. But that still might change as, the, as this increases. So it's not a bad idea. It's just not a, a general recommendation yet. You know, one of the things that we're seeing as well is, is people also survive from this. They're, they're recovering. They yes. are getting released from isolation. Uh, one of the questions that we also had come in through our, our website was specifically about that. If someone tested positive, recovered, is there a chance that they could catch this again? Or has their body sort of adapted and built those antibodies to 
and and their risk level kind of goes down because they've already gone through this. That's a that's a great question. So at this point, what we're seeing, and again, we only have three months of da data on this. Um, folks that are that are recovering are developing antibodies, which is normal. Anytime you're fighting an infection, your body develops protection, and the protection is antibodies. Now, those antibodies, they're actually studying them right now to see if those antibodies can help people who are sick get better quickly. There's some trials, nationwide trials that are going on for that. Still hasn't been proven, but there's a chance that it could help. But as far as getting reinfected, what they're seeing is those antibodies last for a, a period of time. We just don't know how long. So in the same way that some infections you can get again, there's a chance that you could get COVID again. We just don't have enough data to know for sure. But it doesn't seem likely that at least in the following couple of months that you'll pick it up again. Now, a year later, is it possible? You know, six months later, is it possible? That's still to be seen. But in the immediately, immediate time after convalescing from COVID-19, um, it seems that you do have a little bit of protection, at least for those following couple of months. I like this question from Kellyanne, who says, why quarantine for 14 days? What happens after you comply with the 14 days and you have no symptoms? What happens then? The 14 days to some of us just feels kind of arbitrary. Why is that such a critical timeline? So 14 days is, at this point, it is a little arbitrary. We don't know for, for certain exactly how long that virus is sticking around in folks' systems. But 14 days is a good amount of time. Um, to assume that if you've been exposed and you haven't developed symptoms, it's, that's what we think is the incubation period right now. Could it be a little bit longer? It's possible. But in general, we think that this is probably the amount of time that you would have symptoms if you've come across COVID-19, which is why we're recommending for the 14 days to stay away from other people, protect yourself from other people, um, to make sure that you're not transmitting it. Now, we've talked about the asymptomatic spread, which is what is also concerning, because if you don't have symptoms, you still could have the infection and still be asymptomatic. And that is why until we figure all of these things out, the recommendation is to stay home. There's so much more we need to learn about this virus. They're working on treatments, they're working on vaccines. So right now the goal is to really flatten the curve until we figure out exactly what this virus is doing, what we need to do about it, and answer some of these, these questions that are popping up. You know, we, excuse me, we are seeing a, a lot of questions that we know that we have a very limited amount of time. So sort of in sort of wrapping up, uh, what would your message be, I think, overall to those people, again, who think that they may have symptoms um, or, or questioning, wait, I woke up this morning and my throat is sore and I have a fever, you know, maybe they don't necessarily have access to go to or time to go to these test stations because we're learning that it takes a long time. What are some other alternatives or what would you recommend for anyone out there who may be questioning if they have this or not? So the best thing that's happened is access to telehealth. In this day and age, just the same way that we're talking over uh, video conferencing, you can see your doctor the same way. In fact, I work on a telemedicine platform as well where I see patients all day long where I talk to them just the way that I'm seeing you. I can do examinations, talk about symptoms, and then decide whether or not there is a need to go get tested. And if you are to get tested, we can usually fast track you. So um, uh, all, uh, the insurance companies, at least I know HMSA for sure, has approved for patients to get telehealth access without having to have any co-pays. And so they've got access on their website. I think UHA also has access on their website. Go if whatever health insurance company that you have, check out their resources and access telehealth. So jump on your phone, jump on your computer, follow the directions, and you can actually talk to a physician and find out if you need to get tested. I work on a platform called We Prescribe. It's great for, especially, we, uh, we can take any, basically any patients, including those that don't have insurance, because I know that's a real big concern for folks that don't have um, healthcare insurance. Um, we can fast track you, meaning when you go to a testing center, what happens is that you get put in a line with all these folks who are also questioning whether or not they need to get tested. So they're having to go through all their symptoms and everything there, and that's what's leading to some of the backups. Whereas if you can do this from the convenience of your home, then at least you're not standing, staying in those lines, even if you are in your car, you're not risking any exposure by going out. And if you don't need to get tested or they tell you, hey, let's watch your symptoms, they can come up with a game plan for you. It's also really good if you don't have, if you're not worried about COVID and you have like a UTI or you have something 
completely unrelated to COVID, instead of going in and risking exposure, access telehealth. I can't stress that enough. It's so important right now. And it's awesome that we have that capability. Okay, great. Thank you so much. If you've got more questions for Dr. Rupi, you can interact with her directly at coronavirushawaii.com. She takes your questions all week long. She will answer in person, which is such an amazing resource. We thank you for being available there. We will thank definitely you. have you on this show again in the weeks to come. Thank you so much, Dr. That's Rupi. Great. Thank you so thank much. You. Great to have her on, and we want to get we wanted to get her as soon as possible uh, because we know she's very busy. She's got to see some patients. We're going to look uh, through these questions, and we will give them to her, and she can try to answer as many as she can that we didn't get to today at coronavirushawaii.com. Uh, we do want to talk about some headlines and some other news today, so stick with us for that, and also let us know who you would like to see on this platform. We've got the mayor, Senator Schatz, and uh, Scott Murakami from the Unemployment Office coming up this week. So we've got some great guests and we'd love to know who you think should be on. But Ryan, let's get to the count. Yeah, so again, we are continuing to see those numbers rise. Again, these are the numbers that were released yesterday on Sunday. And as of Sunday, there were 20 new cases reporting for a total of 371 positive cases. The death toll continues to be at four. Again, this is gonna be a critical week, not only for us uh, here in Hawaii, but really through the nation as uh, a lot of the experts and those who are uh, really involved in this say this is a critical week for the country and especially for the state. So we will likely continue to see those numbers rise again today. And uh, we saw over the weekend as well, we had there were two test sites that actually happened here on Oahu once again, uh, the drive through check ins, uh, drive through testings that happened that also saw uh, a lot of people once again show up. Yeah, and the University of Washington, they're out with a model now that projects the disease impact state by state. When it comes to Hawaii, they're saying we could see the peak of the impact actually in May, at the beginning of May. We could see as many as 12 deaths a day in Hawaii, which is why it is so important for us to stay home. So to that end, the uh, Star Advertiser's big question of the day, based on how things are going, how long do you think this stay-at-home policy will last? Uh, right now, and this, is, this of course is informal polling, uh, but the choices are end of May into the summer or April 30th, which is when uh, the mandate is supposed to be lifted. End of May is what is trending now, but we wanna hear your thoughts and comments. So put a comment here, and then when this is piled, make sure to vote on the Stour Advertisers homepage. The last time we had the mayor on, the mayor said that he thought this was gonna go past April 30th. We're having him on again this week, and we will ask him if he still holds by that, if he thinks that this is going to extend. Another thing that we saw today was really the enforcement at Hawaii's airports where the National Guard uh, are now in place and actually checking temperatures of those passengers uh, arriving to the islands, as well as those uh, who, again, are coming in and have to go under that 14 day mandatory quarantine uh, that is in place here for the entire state. Now, state arrivals, the HTA has reported that those numbers were up. Again, not a lot. And a lot of those are due to crew members that are coming off airplanes, but still the arrivals were up uh, from the day earlier, which uh, again, the report came out on Saturday, the day earlier was Friday. Uh, so those numbers continuing to rise. We were able to talk to some HTA officials over the weekend who sort of explained that process. And they assured uh, that they are going through these, they call everybody at least once a day uh, you know, they, they have a sort of a protocol set up in place. And so we're actually going to try to get someone from HEA to come on here to talk to us about what exactly that looks like. Uh, they are now using employees of the HEA to sort of oversee this 14 day quarantine enforcement and how they're going about doing that. We also know that we're seeing arrests that have been happening over the weekend as well, especially on the island of Kauai. Yeah, the Kauai mayor really taking it uh, very seriously and arresting visitors there who have not been complying. We'd love to know what you think, if you think that there should be more arrests. Uh, we did see the paper was able to capture pictures of people who looked like they were lounging on beaches. Um, so not everyone following that stay at home order you know, visitor or not. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to tell you about was the paper's got a great list of services that can deliver food to your door. We're talking about from farm to your farm to table, if you will, except for the table being your table as opposed to a restaurant. Um, it's a great article by Pat G and uh, it's focusing on Oahu Fresh, which is one of those subscription services. But at the end of the article, it's got a great list of all different ways that you can connect with farmers. So we wanna encourage you to do that to avoid the grocery 
grocery store. If you can, just stay home, get those deliveries, support the farmers, um, and don't put yourself at risk. And like we always do uh, here at the COVID Care Conversation, we not only want to inform you and connect you, but we also want to highlight some of the great things that are happening in our community with our Hawaii Hero. And today our Hawaii Hero are the students and teachers at Iolani School. Yeah, uh, they've made hundreds of face shields for Hawaii healthcare workers. The faculty and staff there made 1,500 alone last week for firefighters, physicians, dentists pharmacists. Um, and check out that picture there on the bottom. You see that's Dr. Alson Inaba at Kapi'olani Medical Center working in the pediatric ER there. Uh, he happens to be an Iolani graduate and he is showing his uh, mahalo there. You can see he actually has one of the face shields on. So we love to see this. Uh, different community organizations, whether it's businesses, nonprofits, schools in this case, stepping up, um, meeting those medical needs. Wonderful to see that. And they continue to use their learning centers there. Um, so we love that. Now, the other thing that we want to tell you, we know a lot of you um, are out of work or maybe know someone who is out of work. So tomorrow we've got a very special guest. Yeah, Scott Murakami, who will be joining us again, the director of labor here for the state of Hawaii. We'll be talking through some of the unemployment struggles that uh, they're facing on their end. Again, a surge of people applying online uh, and trying to get into the, for those benefits. And so getting an update on where they're at right now as they continue to see more and more people come in, sort of the efforts that are making in terms of getting payment out for those who have filed for unemployment. We saw a large number of questions and people asking questions directly about that. So we thought it was important to bring him back one week later to sort of address some of those concerns again and give you an opportunity to sort of ask your questions. So if you are filing for unemployment or know someone and have questions, it's a perfect opportunity now to sort of get engaged and get informed about what's happening. Again, that's tomorrow at 10.30. Uh, he'll be here joining us live. Yeah, bring your unemployment questions there. Uh, I like this question from Adele asking, does the local resident hosting an out-of-state traveler, uh, is that person subject to the quarantine? Our understanding is that that person is not. It is just the person who was traveling. Um, but that person, you know, if you're hosting someone from out of town, the advice is that that person should be in a separate part of the house. They should use a separate restroom. They should probably be wearing a mask. You heard Dr. Rupi say that uh, she doesn't advise masks at home unless someone is sick. And the thought is that if someone is coming in their quarantine, you should assume that they have been exposed to the virus. So probably not a great idea to be hosting an out of town guest unless it is absolutely necessary. Um, we always give you the resources. So uh, those are in the show notes. So I put them there early this morning. So you have them there. But um, we also have a little graphic here. Those are all numbers that you can call Aloha United Way and the Queens Medical Center there those two numbers. They've got uh, staff on hand that can answer any questions if you think that you might be sick. Um, and then one Oahu.org or 768 city is the city uh, resource center. Um, and then that unemployment, uh, the claims <laughs> website there, but you get to talk to Scott directly tomorrow. So save your questions for him. Yeah, that's right. And again, uh, so Scott uh, Murakami will be on tomorrow. Then we'll have Senator Brian Schatz talking about some of the efforts that's being made on the federal level. Uh, we know there, there was a large influx of people who applied for the FBA loans that were made available on Friday. Uh, and then we'll be talking to Honolulu Mayor Kirk Caldwell again on Thursday. Uh, so a lot of things happening this week, of course, as we enter now, I believe this is week two or three, three, three <laughs> of the, because the, March 23rd was the yeah. official order from the mayor. So week three, it feels like three months. Uh, but again, we're in it for the long haul and we want to encourage everybody out there. Uh, the number one thing you can do is stay home. Uh, that's one of the efforts that again, the city and state uh, are trying to enforce uh, so that we don't end up like some of the other cities that we're seeing throughout the world. Yeah, do us a favor, please share this video. I thought that Dr. Rupi had a lot of great things today. So to say, so uh, share that on your page, like this video, leave us a comment on who you'd like to hear from next or what areas you'd like, what topics you'd like us to try to cover. We can go out and call whoever we know in our networks and try to get more guests on that you want to hear from. Um, get the word out about this show. We mahalo our sponsor, the Hawaii Executive Collaborative. They are a consortium of business and civic leaders working to make Hawaii a better place. And of course, thanks to the Star Advertiser, all the reporters and editors working so hard there to bring you all the information about the coronavirus pandemic here in Hawaii and around the world. Yeah, you can find more information by visiting the Honolulu Star Advertiser, web Advertiser website. Sign up for a special push alert for that as well. 
as well as get all the details and updates throughout the day. Until then, we will see you right back here tomorrow at 10.30. Aloha. Aloha.